the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade earlier this summer is the latest front in the battle for women's rights in this country, a fight that goes back more than 100 years. Judy Woodruff recently sat down with author Elizabeth Griffith, who explores the history of women and the rights they've sought to secure in her latest book, Formidable, American Women and the Fight for Equality, 1920 to 2020. Betsy Griffith, welcome to the News Hour. You and I have known each other a long time. You've written this remarkable, definitive book on the early women's rights activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And here you are with this book on a hundred years, a century of American women. What did you want to do with this book? that hadn't been done in other looks at American women. I wanted to talk about, in one place, how women use the vote. So much hoopla about the 19th Amendment getting the vote, but that it didn't end there. That was not a complete victory. It took formidable women against formidable opponents, taking a long time to reach these victories. There were, the cast is huge, and it's a much more diverse cast than most people understand much more diverse and in ways that hardly anyone had written about uh, before. You spell out so many of the ups and downs, the obstacles, the movement confronted along the way, and you're very clear about the, the cross currents with the fight for racial equality in this country. I mean, in writing that even some of the early best-known women's rights activists were outright racist had the biases of their era, yeah. uh, and it made it hard to create the coalitions that were necessary. It's really only in the immediate lead up to the passage of the 19th Amendment, they begin to understand the need for multicultural, cross-generational, multiracial coalitions, but they splinter again because black and white women had different goals. Black women wanted all the rights that white people had, but primarily physical safety. They wanted to end racial violence and lynching, have access to jobs, and all the discrimination they confronted. White women had a much narrower um, list. They wanted equal legal treatment, equal political access. And it took them a long time to understand that working together, they might gain more. So there were parallel tracks for a long time. It really isn't until after the 1970s that there's much coalition at all among these groups. Describe, if you will, just a few of the, the frankly, overlooked uh, black and Hispanic women activists that, that you write about. Black women, in some ways, purposely kept themselves behind the scenes. They wanted to put black men up front. They'd been so... Uh, discriminated against for so long that allowing ministers and civic leaders to take the public roles. So black women worked behind the scenes. But women like Ella Baker, Daisy Bates, Septima Clark, slowly supported, were able to support the people in the front. Ella Baker is an excellent example. She was a longtime member of the NAACP in North Carolina, then in New York City. And then when the Montgomery bus boycott starts, she says to Martin Luther King, I'll send you money. And then when it succeeds and he just wants to be a parish rector, she and the women in his congregation say, no, no, Martin, you need to do more. He founds the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and she's his first employee. And then there were Hispanic. Latino women as well. There were. Um, the first woman to run, um, to, to really come to public notice in the 1920s, became Secretary of State in New Mexico, Soledad Chacon. But most of those women grew up from farming roots, uh, having to be agricultural workers. Dolores Huerta, of course, is the splendid example of lifelong leadership in that regard. We think of the women's movement as all about equal pay, that it's a democratic party movement. But in fact, there are so many prominent women, of course, at the, on the conservative side of the ledger, from Phyllis Schlafly to today, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the women prominently supporting well, Donald Trump. This is a much broader uh, Let's backtrack picture. a minute because the early women's movement was primarily Republican for, for both black and white women. Um, the Republican Party was much more supportive because the Democrats were dominated by Southern Democrats and white supremacists. So the Equal Rights Amendment is first introduced by Republicans. Black women don't change to the Democratic Party until late into the New Deal, encouraged by Mary McLeod Bethune. So within the parties, you have issues about women's rights, and then the parties divide over women's rights. What do you make of the fact, Betsy Griffith, that you look at the Supreme Court, all three of the liberal members of the court now are women? Yes. One of the six more conservative members is a woman. 
What does that say to us, do you think? Well, that's a pretty good demonstration of the diversity of political opinion among women in leadership. Um, but it also shows the power of, of politics and presidential appointment and uh, issue-driven um, elections. The Supreme Court is critically important in the history of women. In the 60s, 70s, and partly into the 80s, many of their decisions advanced women dramatically. But then as the appointments become more conservative during the 80s, the tenor of the court changes. You see it most dramatically in the abortion decisions, but you see it in other restraints being put on women. Is it possible to even write a comprehensive history of women anymore? I mean, women are everywhere. They're in virtually every walk of life. Well, one could say except the Oval Office. Um, this is true. What's, what's frustrating, and in my conclusion, I was, I mean, clearly enormous progress has been made for women in this last century. But it's not enough. We haven't gone far enough. Um, women are underemployed and underpaid in, in lowest paying jobs. Women are undervalued in domestic roles. Women are victims of domestic violence. Maternal and infant health has not improved dramatically since 1920. And women, more than the majority of the population, more women are registered, more women turn out, and the largest percentage of women in any political office is the state legislature, and we're under 30%. So I wouldn't say we were making progress too quickly. And among those women, of course, there's all that division. And indeed, as you say in the book, the fight for equality goes on. The baton has to be picked up by each generation. Elizabeth Griffith, thank you very much. The book is Formidable, American Women and the Fight for Equality, 1920 to 2020. Thank you. Thank you.